Hey! Hello. Welcome to D&D Time Talks, the show where we discuss all things Dungeons and Dragons. I'm Pete. I'm Jeremy. Pete, how are you? I am quite well. Jeremy, how are you doing? I'm a little off, but you know, such such is how today today is. Well, that seems like it's very much the right mindset to be in for the subclasses that we're talking about tonight. That is true. <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> But um, Pete, before we talk about the subclass, before we dive into the show in general, I've got something a little, a little something or other up on the screen right here. Ah, uh, yes. That uh, I was, you know, I was hoping we could share with our with our players this evening. Uh, Jeremy, please share. Well, everybody, uh, as you're all aware, uh, up and coming is our annual Carnival of Souls event uh, in in D and D time. Which means, what does this mean, Pete? What does the Carnival of Souls mean for the land of D&D time? The Carnival of Souls is our Halloween event. It's big, it's extravagant, it's a lot of fun, and it means exclusive loot. Exclusive loot, Jeremy. And that's kind of part of the purpose of what we have up there on the screen for you. Precisely. So I'm going to put this link in the chat right now. If you're here watching our D&D time talk, that means you guys can be the first the very first to check out our all of our Carnival of Soul stuff for this year. Uh, it's a nice link up on our website. You can learn all about how our event is going to kind of be run throughout the year, and you can check out some of the cool treasures that are going to be available. Um, I'm sure there's more to come in the future, but for now, enjoy and peruse and decide maybe what, what is most interesting to you. Um, and when Jeremy says the first one to see these, what he means is the exit to see them, assuming you, know, you could have been the first if you saw that D&D time bruise, as a lot of these items were made by you guys. Uh, and some of them were, true. yeah, some of them were tweaked to touch uh, just to make them right for what we were doing. Uh, but all these items are very cool and, and they were made by the community here. So excited for you guys yeah. to get a chance to handle them. So yeah, check those out. Uh, we're going to put an official link after the stream in the Discord server. So make sure you're on our Discord server as well. Indeed. Um, uh, also, Reflected108 just subscribed at Tier 1. They've been subscribed uh, for 20 uh, months. Uh, his comment there is, <laughs> that's 20 out of 282 months of life. 10% will be here soon. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, my. When you say it like that, well done, my dude. <laughs> Thank you for your support. We wholeheartedly appreciate it. Thank you. Plans. Um, and don't forget, everyone, everyone's changing their usernames on our Discord to be slightly spookier, so I guess do that if you want. <laughs> oh, do I have to do that? Uh, I mean, everyone else has, Pete. But this is all here or there. Uh, let's move on to our actual topic for today, which is this on Earth Arcana. This Unearthed Arcana came out, what, like three weeks ago, just about now? Uh, and it's for new subclass options for the Sorcerer and the Warlock. Um, and I guess, like, just, I guess before we dive into it wholeheartedly, let's just, like, talk briefly about what these are conceptually. So the two that we got, oh, and what Unearthed Arcana is, oh my god, I'm jumping a little hell ahead of myself. Unearthed Arcana. Uh, is a playtest supplement that Wizards of the Coast releases for 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons. It comes out pretty sporadically. Um, they used to be doing it every month, but it's just random when they do it now, it seems. Um, but there have been a lot back to back to back. And what these are for, it's to release new, especially contentious concepts into the eye of the community so they can be playtested and then so that, they, that Wizards can receive criticism, comments, and the community's thoughts on it before finalizing them and actually ending them, pu putting them in our, uh, in books. So. And today, me and Jeremy are the community. Yeah, today. Uh, and we will be providing our thoughts uh, on these. And um, I think our thoughts on these are going to be, have more positives in them than I think we have in some of the last. There's also, <laughs> there are also non-positives, uh, but these ones were mm -hmm. both pretty cool. I, I enjoyed looking at them, and I think it shows a lot of, you know, a lot of cool design ideas. Uh, in particular, I was a fan of the sorcerer. Yeah, I mean, these are, these are two really cool concepts. Uh, the Aberrant Mind Sorcerer, which is a sorcerer whose um, 
innate magic comes from this uh, an encounter they've had with the far realm at some point in their life uh and then the uh the lurker in the deep warlock whose patron could be any sort of ancient primordial sea dwelling being um maybe a cthulhu like entity or uh, a kraken or an elemental of some kind uh, a marid is another example kind of a water genie there are so many different things that you could go with or you could make up your own whatever uh lurker in the deep is so yeah, these are really cool. I put I just put a link in the chat if you want to follow along as we kind of talk through these. And, you know, Pete and I, we're going to come at this with a bit of a critical eye because obviously if they didn't think it were, was cool, they wouldn't have put it out here, right? They wouldn't have said, hey guys, tell us how you feel about this bad content we made. So it's good. It's cool content. But if, uh, if we feel like we're being a little overly critical, that's kind of our job at this point. It's the play test period. We got, we're supposed to be pretty, pretty, a little bleh, more critical. Also, um, Jeremy, I never thought of a genie patron, but I want to make a genie. Yeah, right. I want to make, honestly, I want to make a whole genie warlock. <laughs> the capstone is probably you just get a wish. Um, That's a really sick capstone, actually. That's yeah. so cool. Yeah. What's weird is that's, that's, that's cooler to me than, like... A wizard getting wish at, not, at, at 17th level? No, that is way cool. Well, because it also, it, it doesn't feel like the wish spell. It feels like you're making a wish. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's aside the point. This is, this is a tangent. I'm probably going to <laughs> Future make that. Future d time brew! <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I'm probably going to make that just on, on the down low for Flinskies now that I'm excited about it. But this is all aside the point. I um, want to start getting into the, uh, the first, the sorcerer here, the sorcerer's origin. Yeah, oh goodness, I zoomed in too much. So these are probably, we saved these a couple weeks because these are kind of the spoopiest ones. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll launch us off for the Sorcerer Sword. So yeah, sorcerer the Aberrant Mind. Yeah, as a class in 5th edition, a Sorcerer um, is kind of the premier spellcaster next to the Wizard. Those two share that role. And they get a subclass starting at their very first level. So a subclass is super important in defining what the sorcerer is, and a fair amount of power ends up getting wrapped up in it. So this is for the Aberrant Mind. An alien influence has wrapped its tendrils around you, warping you in both body and mind. Perhaps a psychic splinter lodged in your psyche after you suffered domination by an apple. Maybe you were born somewhere tainted by the Far Realm, a planar blot that changed you forever. Or perhaps Mind Flayers kidnapped you, subjecting you to the nightmarish process of ceramorphosis. But the transformation failed and left you otherwise unaltered. Uh, and then there's a little bit of, of more flavor text. Unique disturbance, regardless of the genesis, uh, the aberrant mind origin imparts a sense of eeriness to the character or surroundings. This can be as subtle as when your sorcerer reads a creature's mind with detect thoughts. Everyone in the immediate vicinity feels a faint but pervasive sense of dread. Or perhaps it could be more unmistakable, such as sweating a sheen of viscous mucus when you're frightened or your pupils squirming when you're excited. Uh, consider the potentially unspeakable source of your sorcerer's power and use that as a guide to weave threads of eeriness throughout your magic. I love this conceptually. Yeah, agreed. Um, That's just very cool. Uh, it's a lot of the old one flavor, but now in a warlock. And it feels, the old one was always very kind of abstract and it's an eldritch being of some kind. Mm -hmm. This very much puts you in that, no, we're talking Cthulhuan aberrant you know, it, it makes it very yeah. clear that we're talking aberrations and not just some more neutral elder being. Um, I like it. It's cool. Well, and beyond that, compared to the existing warlock subclasses, which are Divine Soul, Draconic Bloodline, Shadow, Storm Magic, and Wild Magic, this is a very unique and uh, it's very much its own archetype. It doesn't overlap those at all in any way. And so I, I see this as a very like meaningful addition to the warlock. I'm sorry, to the sorcerer uh, kind of pantheon of subclasses. But let's let's start diving in. What do you what do you get as a um 
as an aberrant mind sorcerer, Pete. Uh, so shall we, um, do you want to go through everything that's at level one at once, or do you want to yeah. one at a time this? Yeah, let's talk about everything at level one at once. Great. Um, so the first feature that you get is invasive thoughts. At first level, you gain the ability to use a bonus action to magically create a telepathic link with one creature you can see within 30 feet of you. Until the link ends, you can telepathically speak to the target through the link, and if it understands at least one language, it can speak telepathically to you. The link lasts for 10 minutes and ends early if you are incapacitated or die, or if you use another bonus action to break the link or to establish this link with a different creature. This is Invasive Thoughts, uh, a simple telepathy feature, not unlike the one that the old one Warlock gets, which lets you get like a very limited telepathy, but a little bit, in my opinion, actually a little bit better done. Well, it's weird, right? Because there's some strangeness comparing the two. Because the this one is tied to a bonus action, yeah. right? It's one creature, but it specifies that the creature can talk back to you. Which is a nice thing to have put on there. I wish that the other one did that, because I feel like that is their intention, but it's yeah. not clear on the other one. Um, well, so I'm glad that they put that in. Yeah, I'm just, the thing that con- confuses me here, or I guess... I don't confuse me. I'm just a little surprised. Why the bonus action? I think the I idea mean, is they don't want it to function essentially like a Rary's telepathic bond in yeah. combat, where you're essentially acting as a hub and just being free speech between everyone by, I think, tying an action economy yeah. to it makes it so it's not too good at early levels. Like that. That's fair. All right. I guess I get that. Uh, let's move on to that second feature. Uh, you want me to cover this one, Pete? Yeah, do sign spells. Yeah, they get this feature, psionic spells. And these are really important because they're going to show up later in, in the subclasses we talk about. Starting at first level, your aberrant nature changes your mind in subtle ways. Subtle but profound ways. You learn additional spells when you reach certain levels in the class, as shown in the spells table, but uh, and the spells count as sorcerer spells for you. But it doesn't count against another other sorcerer spells you know. These spells can't be replaced when you gain a level in this class. And the spells are Arms of Hadar and Dissonant Whispers at first level, Calm Emotions that Detect Thoughts at third, Hunger of Hadar and Sending at fifth, Compulsion and Avar's Black Tentacles at seventh, Modify Memory and Rary's Telepathic Bond at ninth. Um, I really, well, here's the thing. A lot of the newer sorcerers have these additional spells, and that's something that the the original two, the the, uh, the draconic and the wild magic sorcerer, didn't have. And that's a huge having these extra spells means a ton for sorcerers. So I'm yeah, glad that they kept sure. doing that because the divine soul and the shadow and the storm feel good because they have the, like these extra spells. Yeah, I'm almost surprised that they haven't done a revised where they put spells yeah, on the well, older ones which it's a shame yeah uh but uh let's get into um warped being the final first level feature because you get a lot oh my God, uh, in like this class. Third. yeah there's a lot in this subclass at, at uh, level one and that is starting at first level your aberrant origin protects you from harm your body might have a coating of viscous slime tough hide scales or an invisible psionic barrier Choose the form of the protection when you gain this feature. Whatever form the protection takes, your AC equals 13 plus your dexterity modifier while you aren't wearing armor. All right, uh, so this is almost identical to the, or actually, I think this is just identical to the dragon draconic sorcerer ability, which is that they mm-hmm. get the same thing. They get an extra AC with dragon scales. You get it with, you know, whatever it is that you've decided your aberrant patron is like, something that reflects that. No. The, the Draconic Sorcerer actually gets a little bit more health as well. Yes. Um, but otherwise, the armor class is about the same. This is very typical for a spellcaster using mage armor. This is yep. just saying you don't need mage armor on this character. You just have good armor class. I, it's cool. Um, Let's talk so... about how we feel these three are. Okay. Um, do you want to go first or would you like me to? Uh, yeah, you can go ahead and take a swing at these first three. What, what's your thoughts? Sure. Um, I like all of these features a lot. I think they're well put together. I think the spell list is very uh, very evocative, especially when we get into a later feature and we talk about how it's going to be used, because that's my favorite little bit of design in this particular class. Um, it's, I think, just a, a touch overtuned uh, based on the other sorcerers. Um, not mm-hmm. massively, but when I compare the thing that you're comparing, and it's not crazy. I mean, obviously, there's the psionic spells. I'm discounting that to a certain extent because it's utility and it's not necessarily 
you know, power, even though it is really nice and it makes the class more fun to play. Um, but just talking invasive thoughts versus the extra health and the, I think, charisma checks that you get from a charisma checks against a certain type of dragon. Yeah. Uh, which is, ba- that's basically irrelevant. So it's really the health. I agree. Um, I think invasive thoughts is considerably. It's because when you look at the draconic sorcerer or the wild magic sorcerer in the player's handbook, these level one features are way better. They're just mechanically superior. Yeah. When you look at the divine soul sorcerer, which the divine soul sorcerer gets to just pick by from all of the, the cleric spells amongst with their spell list, and they get some free or one freebie instead of, you know, a handful of freebies. I don't know. I think I think the uh, the divine soul sorcerer it probably has this beat. Oh but yeah, not by, but not yeah. by that much. Well, honestly, invasive thoughts. There's you know, invasive thoughts is very good at level one, and I think this dunks on draconic sorcerer at level one. But if you think of it as like at level twenty, would you rather have invasive thoughts or twenty hit points? I think a lot I'd of the time, I think you'd rather have the twenty hit points because a lot this of the is time, so much more fun. Oh, yeah. See, that's the point. If we're talking just which one you like more, it's invasive thoughts. But which one's better? I think, like, mechanically, the 20 hit points are, are probably better, because you have but, better telepathy spells later on, I, too. And I think, I think you, you're right, overall. This is pretty, this is pretty good. So I think this is, is reasonable, even though it seems like a lot. But it's still definitely but, a touch over the curve. I do want to say, but, if we're going to pick our battles... This isn't where we want to pick our battle on this sorcerer because there are some other very powerful features later on we're going to talk about. And let's jump down to them now. Keep in mind these psionic spells, which the most, in my opinion, critical ones here to pay attention to are Dissonant Whispers and uh, Compulsion and Modify Memory. So just remember those three, at least for me, as we go on to the sixth level feature they get, which is Psionic Sorcery. Yes. Beginning at 6th level, when you cast any of the spells gained from your psionic spells feature, we just looked at them, you can cast it uh, by expending a spell slot as normal or by spending a number of sorcery points equal to the spell's level. If you cast the spell using sorcery points, it requires no component. This is so important. Oh, righteous though. It's super cool. This is the reason that players pick the subtle spell meta magic because it lets you be sneaky with your abilities. And a few of those spells, dissonant whispers, compulsion, and modify memory, being able to just cast those without anyone being able to know are very, potentially very, very powerful, in my opinion. I agree. But it's also just so it's cool. Super cool. It's so cool. The ability to just kind of look at someone and, and that like this ability get makes me this made me feel like I wanted to play this more than anything because it embodies that like mind flare thing where you expect them to look at you and all of a sudden your mind is just wrenched and altered without even like you know, without them saying a word and you just kind of like fall over confused. While your party's looking at you like, what's wrong? This is that. Um, I love this feature. Mm-hmm. But, Jeremy, I think you have some reservations because it is definitely very powerful. Well, and that's another interesting point beyond it. Beyond this, the raw power is simply, what does this do as compared to some of the other class features that other subclasses get? And this is from a, just a pure balance perspective. You know, at 6th level, the best other option is probably the Divine Soul Sorcerer, who can, they get some dice to heal people. I'm sorry, when they, they can spend a sorcery point to re-roll dice on healing spells, just like the Empowered Spell Meta Magic, but for healing. Um, Well, let's, before we go on further on this, there's a whole uh other feature, Jeremy. They get oh, at right. six level. This was oh, sorry. This was only half of what they get at six level. I'm yeah. sorry, Pete. They also get uh, which, psychic defenses, uh, which, which is course, no whole... other class, no other subclass gets two abilities at six level. But sorry, yeah, Pete. that's fine. Uh, at six level, you gain resistance to psychic damage, and you have advantage on saving throws against being charmed or frightened. Okay, um, it's good. That's, it's that's good. all extremely powerful. Um, l- looking at. <laughs> 
the, the charmed or frightened is meaningful, but the resistance to psychic damage is actually almost a ribbon. Almost. Almost. Um, because psychic damage is so rare. That's fair. That's a fair point. Um, and it's, like only it's very other good when you're up against mind flayers, but... Yeah. Uh, but the charmed frightened is, is definitely big. Uh, yeah. Compared to, say, the, the draconic, which lets you expend sorcery points to get a resistance for a short amount of time. Yeah. Um, so this is overtuned by quite a bit. Yeah, there's a lot of power creep here. And the most important note about this psionic sorcery is, and this is where the real issue comes in, this is taking something that the sorcerer already has, which is the ability to turn sorcery points into spell slots, and saying, you can just do it better. And there are no components. It's just a little dicey. This is a warlock, I mean a sorcerer rather, that maybe doesn't take subtle spell because they don't need to, and they can get another cool... I mean, in this psionic sorcery ability, they get more efficient use of sorcery points. They get to basically get a freebie meta magic. There's a lot that comes in with this ability. And given the that they get another really good feature, yike, this is pretty the strong. Th the thing that saves it for me a bit is it is just the psionic spells. If it was all yeah. spells. Uh, so it is well, like you're limited to spells that feel flavorful for that ability. And it's weird because I love it. It's so Yeah, cute. yeah, yeah. This is such a cool concept. You have this list of psychic spells and they you use this other cool way to cast them. And when you do that, you know, they're just, you don't do anything. Things just happen. You're just standing there motionless and like the black arms of Hadar just come out. Right, that's so cool. That's so neat to me. Um, um, but it's just very, very strong in comparison to all of the stuff that's been previously printed. Yeah. Um, I think you could I think you could take psychic defenses off here mm -hmm. and just have sonic sorcery and it would still be like you'd be It'd still be a little I, touch I'd, on I'd the be strong side. Cautious. I'd be fine with it though. I'd be like, ah, that's a little bit pushing it, yeah. but it's also like it's some features it's I think possible. are so cool they almost justify it. Uh, well, and like we mentioned earlier, this warlock aesthetic or thematically aberrant mind is so different from the existing warlock subclasses and so it's okay it, a little you know there's a bit more wiggle room for it to be more powerful or less powerful than the existing ones because it's a very defined archetype you're not gonna have your oh what if i wanted to play sorcerer and i got my got my power from the gods and i'm not a cleric but i just kind of have them. Well, you're not going to decide, oh, I'm going to play the Aberrant Mind Sorcerer because it's better for this character. No, you're going to play the Divine Soul Sorcerer because it's built for that. You know? Oh, I, I'm a sorcerer and I want my cool power because I, I love dragons and that's really neat. I'm a dragon. You're not going to pick an Aberrant Mind Sorcerer for your cool dragonborn get my power from dragons. It's a chronic sorcerer. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm with you 100%. Um, so... Let's um let's go into Revelation in Flesh. Mind if I take this one away, Jeremy? <laughs> First, such a good ability name. Oh yeah, it's sick. Uh, <laughs> this whole class is this whole class is sick. Um, beginning at fourteenth level, you can unleash the aberrant truth hidden within your flesh. It's also just a cool phrase. Ten out of ten. Yeah, as a bonus action, you can spend one or more sorcery points to magically transform your body for one minute. Each sorcery point you spend, you can gain one of the following benefits of your choice the effect of which lasts until the transformation ends. And here are the effects. You gain a swimming speed equals your walking speed and the ability to breathe water. Um, and some flavor about how it works. Uh, you gain, or how it looks, you gain a flying speed equal to your walking speed and can hover. As you fly, your skin glistens with mucus. Uh, your body, along with any equipment you are wearing or carrying, becomes slimy and pliable. <laughs> You can move through any space as narrow as one inch without squeezing, and you can spend five feet of movement to escape non-magical restraints or being grappled. And the last one, your eyes turn black or become writhing sensory, sensory tendrils. You are aware of the location of any hidden or invisible creature within 60 feet of you. All right, this is extremely powerful and brutally efficient for the power level. Yep, it's absolutely busted in comparison to what the other sorcerers get at this level. And just to start it off, I mean, it's got the one, the one downside is it costs at least one sorcery point. Yeah. But 
I'm going to look at this one ability. You gain a flying speed equal to your walking speed and can hover. As you fly, your skin glistens with mucus. Which is, I mean, I, I, it's cool. I yeah, like it. Yeah, it's cool. I dig it. But compare that to the Divine Soul Sorcerer. Otherworldly wings, you gain a flying speed of 30 feet. The Draconic Bloodline Sorcerer. Dragon wings, you gain a flying speed of 30 feet. Oh, no, flying speed equal to your current speed. So that's actually kind of on par. Um, and shadow magic, shadow walk. You can teleport up to 120 feet when you're in dim light or dark. What I see here is, with, with, by the way, they're just using equal to your walking speed versus 30 feet like they did in the Divine Soul. You're getting some weirdness in there where like, ah, oh, I'm a tabaxi. I'm going to use my tabaxi racial feature to double my speed. Now I can fly twice as fast because I'm running on all four legs confusion i just i think this should be a flat number but even then two other warlocks i mean sorcerer subclasses have this exact feature or very comparable one as their entire level 14 ability um and then this also has a swim speed and squeezing through space yeah. not being grappled and you can see invisible it's just got like hey guys you're all the other sorcerers but more but wait, yeah, one more. thing. Uh, one thing I will say in defense of this one is the other ones do just kind of get their features, like the dragon wings, for example. You do just get to fly. Oh, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. Um, so I think you know it's not as egregious, even well, as like I'm sure of that and looking at them. The dragon um, one, uh, yeah. Uh, you just as a bonus action can just you make can wings just sprout up, and then you yeah. can get rid of them. Yeah, um, so, you know, it is one minute, and you have to spend a sorcery point to do it. Now, generally speaking, having them for one minute is going to be effectively the same as having them for In all time. Yes. yes. Um, or, be, you know, outside of combat, too, you're going to be in a, like a, some kind of puzzle room where it's like, oh, you have to climb up the rope to get to the next area. And you're like, well, I'll fly. Um, and you have to spend a sorcery point to do that. Um, but just the sheer variety of the utility here and that you can uh, neutralize so many situations with this one feature. Yeah. Um, and just a very minor note, you know, they, they were pretty good up until now about saying, yeah, you know what, you, the, you can make your crazy aberrant nature however you want. Well, not anymore. At this point, nope, your skin glistens with mucus. Nope, you're slimy and pliable. I mean, I, it's fine. I'm not going to, like, argue it too much. Yeah, it's but, not, like, terrible. Yeah, it's just, it's weird that they went from build your own crazy aberrant creature to, no, no, these are the things that happen to you. Um, anyway, I think we can just agree. Really cool feature. It's sick. It's a revelation in flesh. But it's just more. It's sorcerer plus extra, which is just a little much for me. Yeah. Um... Although I guess maybe we could argue the time difference in the sorcery point is enough to warrant the additional option. Yeah, it's like, I think it's close, but I would still give this the edge, is my thought. Yeah, I think the extrasensory tendrils, this is the one I would cut, personally. Okay. Um, the invisibility site. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, 100% agreed. Uh, and let's talk about their most, in my opinion, absolutely busted beyond measure feature. Yeah, this, this feature is whack. This is whack. And this is wha and look, I'm very much of the opinion that when you get up to 17th, 18th, 19th level, you can do whatever the hell you want. I don't care. This is whack. Even this, is, that. this is too cheesy. It's sick, though. It's super cool. Uh, and it's called Warp Reality. At 18th level, you become the focal point of a reality warping anomaly. As an action, you can magically radiate a transparent 20-foot radius aura for one minute. This might take the form of a sphere of rippling psychic energy, a fluctuating uh, amoebotic gel, an extrusion of ephemeral parasites, or some other manifestation. Other creatures in the area treat this aura as difficult terrain, and when they start their turn, they take 2d10 psychic damage. When you activate this feature, you can choose any number of creatures that, uh, that you can see to be unaffected by the aura. If that's where this ability stopped, it'd be okay, but we continue. As a bonus action, you can end the aura early. If you do so, you and any number of creatures you choose in the order aura are teleported to a location you can see within one mile of you. 
Each creature must appear within 20 feet of you, and in an unoccupied space, an unwilling creature that succeeds in a charisma saving throw against your spell save DC is not teleported. Once you use this feature, you cannot use it again until you finish a long rest. Oh my god, forced teleportation. Yeah. This the, is whack. The only thing that I think needs to change on this feature for it, for me to be fine with it is it just needs to be, it only affects willing creatures on the teleport. But that's, the problem is, right, the it's aesthetic very, we're going for here is like, yeah, it's, it's a, a Slender Man, right? Slender Man appears, there's a static, and right? Yeah, and yeah, and yeah. And then someone's gone. That's what they're going for. And I think they nailed it, but it's just, it's just, it doesn't work. Fifth edition does not this. Yeah, it's too cheesy. Yeah. Um, I can picture, I'm I already picturing. I a mile into the sky. All right, the Tarask falls to its death. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's just, it's we're very. Um, we're done here. Yeah. Uh, to circle back to a comment that reflected 10.8 made about the last feature, which was, when you go slimy and pliable, I want to drown, him, drown him in my flesh. Jeez. Oh, dear. Oh, my, oh, my. Uh, anyway, on Warp Reality, yeah, forced, uh, that forced teleportation is too good. Um, just as, like a, a, cool. as a party it's escape thing, cool. um, my first instinct was that's even too good as, like, a get-out-of-jail-free card. But then I thought, well, no, because there's spells like teleport and stuff, and this is, like, casting a high-level spell. But there's... The crux of it is this isn't a spell. This cannot be counterspelled. And that's super yeah, important. I, I mean, that's, that's also true. You're right about that. But yeah. I don't know. This feels like... I mean, for an 18th level feature, I'm fine with it if it didn't have yeah. the unwilling. So, But uh, with the unwilling, it's just, you know, it's ridiculous. It can't yeah, but I think, I think without the unwilling, it loses its point. Um, you may be right about that. It definitely loses yeah. a lot At of At least, the... to me, it loses what makes it sick. So... Personally, my thoughts is when this does come around to eventually getting put into a book, I want this gone completely. It's super cool, but it just, I don't think it can work in 5th edition Dungeons. Um, and it's, it's such a, like, the problem with it is exactly the... Oh, it's awesome. Yeah, it's, well, it's, like, the teleport up a mile into the air is almost exactly the only problem with it. Um, or just like, oh, I teleport into an environment with no atmosphere, or I teleport way underwater and they drown and I use my feet. Like, there's so many yeah. different, like, little things you can do, but when it's just what it is, like, the forced teleportation is fine if it's, like, I could even be very into, there's oh, I go to face the, the enemy alone and teleport them into the trap that me and my party have set up. Like, I'm so into that. You know, I, but then the, the pro yeah, that I'm cool with. But then there's like the dramatic moment where it's the bad guy blocking you from getting to the MacGuffin that's on a countdown to, oh, the bad guy's over here now. The rest of the team goes and stops the MacGuffin. All right, um, the tension's destroyed. It well, just, what makes it cool is what makes it suck. Uh, because well, from the, a drama perspective, I think it would suck. Counterpoint, though. You have to go with them. Yeah, all right. Sure. I mean, there's some drama in that. Maybe your character gets murked, but... Yeah. I mean, well, I think that's, like, I don't know. That That's still That cool sucks for everyone else in the game, though, who now doesn't get to fight the thing they were excited that you're about to battle. You're about to battle Tiamat! And now you're not. Um, I don't know. I feel like, at this level, I could... Again, if it wasn't for, like, the cheese of it, I feel like this could be very cool and I could make it work in a campaign. In particularly, if I knew that my player had it. Like, if this was sprung on you in a situation, like, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just It's close. It, it's close for me. Um, I'm with you, too. Like, I also have big issues with it, but it's, it's close for me. And we're not even going to try to compare this to any of the level 18 abilities that the other sorcerers have. Because <laughs> right. this outclasses presence. them by <laughs> light years. Draconic presence. <laughs> You could, no, just, oh my god. Yeah, Draconic Presence is the uh, most abysmal. Op Ugh. Anyway, moving on. Uh, overall, let's talk our overall thoughts on this uh, Aberrant Mind uh, Sorcerer. I think it's really cool. Yeah. Um, design, overall, some really excellent design choices. You know, Inspired spells. in a lot of places, for sure. Yes, ex absolutely. That's the word I'd go with, inspired. 
the problem is, is it just too much? And can it work in 5e without really upping that power curve? Because, I mean, the real designer's challenge in a game like 5th Edition Dungeons & Dragons is making stuff exciting, engaging, and, and cool, making new content that doesn't obsolete existing content, right? That doesn't up that power curve. And right now, this blows a power curve out of the yeah, out of it, orbit. <laughs> it it needs a haircut in like three different places. It needs it could it it needs to be bald. It needs psychic defenses tr- just stripped away. It needs that invisibility sight, I think, trimmed off, and then warp reality, reality. needs some work. It's just yeah. Uh, it's like it's close, but it's too powerful. I'll say this: if a player brought this to me and asked me to put it in my game. And I looked at the rest of the party and I didn't see anything where, like, for example, there was another sorcerer or, you know, maybe like an old one warlock that I felt was going to feel a little outclassed. Um, then I would allow them to play this in my game. Like, I don't feel like there's anything in here that's too bad. It's just I agree. in the context of others. And, and that warp reality, it depends on the, the player that's doing it, right? Exactly. Like, there are players who will say, I teleport a mile into the air. And there are players who would never do something like that who would not use the warp reality for that. You know, they would use it in a very a different kind of way. Um, a more probably intended way. Yeah. Um, and, you know... That's, yeah, that's me. Also <laughs> well. So, overall, pretty cool. Hopefully they can trim it up a little bit. And it's not... It's pretty close. This is pretty good. Of, like, the Arthur Arcanas we've recently re- re- uh, reviewed, I'd say this is, like, this is the new top. Yeah, 100% of... agreed. This is the, my favorite of the ones that have come out. Yeah. Edging well, out the... And by edging out, I mean dunking on the Heroism Paladin. Oh, yeah. That was my top before this, but this is now my top. Agreed. Let's talk about this second one. So there's another subclass in here. This is an otherworldly patron option for the Warlock. I keep saying Warlock before, but now I'm actually talking about the Warlock, guys. I promise. This is the Lurker in the Deep option. Um, you want me to kick it off, Pete? Yeah, read us, our, read us our flavor. All right. Lurker in the Deep. You made a pact with an entity that lurks somewhere deep within the ocean, or even on the elemental plane of water. Such as mighty as a kraken, an ancient primordial, or a monstrous being from creation's earliest days. You serve as this creature's eyes and ears, watching the world beyond its domain and reporting your findings. You may have gained this pact as a member of a cult dedicated to the entity, or after your patron saved your life when you nearly drowned at sea. And there's a little bit extra flavor text, The Lurker's Clutches. Several features of the Lurker in the Deep create tentacles or a maw that reach into the world. The form of these appendages should reflect the nature of your specific patron. For example, a kraken's warlock might summon great squid-like tentacles, serrated crab claws, or a massive octopus beak. While the servants of a primordial water elemental might create tendrils of, or swells of living water. So basically, just here's some license to reflavor stuff, because there are some very specifically flavored items in the design of this subclass. And... Right off the bat, we got at its level one feature, one of those, one of its level one features is that very heavily flavored item. Um, yeah. So, Pete, you want to take us through the level one? Yeah, why, why not? Um, first off, we have uh, the expanded spell list, which all warlocks get. Uh, and that is the lurker in the deep lets you choose from an expanded list of spells. When you learn a warlock spell, the following spells are added to the warlock spell list for you. And these are Creator, Destroy, Water, and Thunder Wave at first level uh, spells, second level spells, Gust of Wind and Silence, third, Lightning Bolt and Sleet Storm, fourth, Control Water and Avard's Black Tentacles, fifth, Commune with Nature and Cone of Coal. All flavorful. I have no large issue with any of those. Commune with Nature does feel a... What'd you say? Thunder Wave feels a little weird to me. Thunder Wave? Yeah, same with Cone of Cold. Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm not like, they're not horrible. I'm just kind of, I, I don't know. Commune don't with nature uh, felt a little off for me. You know, oh. I thought that too until I read what it does. And what it does, I think, makes some sense, maybe. Um, 
Yeah, I don't know. Flavor wise, like, because your relationship doesn't feel like this doesn't feel like your relationship is with nature. It feels like your relationship is with a big monster. So that's yeah. what throws me off a little bit. It should but, be commune. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, that, that would work for me more. Um, that was an autofill issue on their part. Anyway, let's take us to the most important feature they get at level one. Yeah, Grasp of the Deep is their core feature. At first level, you gain the ability to magically summon a spectral tentacle that strikes at your foes. As a bonus action, you create a 10-foot-long tentacle at a point you can see within 60 feet of you. The tentacle lasts for one minute or until you use this feature to create another tentacle. When you create the tentacle, you can make a melee spell attack against a creature within 10 feet of it. On a hit, the target takes 1d8 cold or lightning damage, your choice when it takes the damage, and its speed is reduced by 10 feet until the start of your next turn. When you reach 10th level in the class, the damage dealt by the tentacle increases to 2d8. As a bonus action on your turn, you can move the tentacle up to 30 feet and repeat the attack. You can summon the tentacle a number of times equal to your charisma modifier, minimum of once, and you regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. Um, pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I the third one. Yeah, oh yes. Um, because we, that wasn't enough. We need more. Uh, I actually really like this feature, though. Uh, Scion of the Deep. At first level, your patron accepts you into its inner court of servitors. You can telepathically communicate with any aberration, beast, elemental, or monstrosity that has an innate swimming speed while it is within 120 feet of you. The creature can understand you and can respond telepathically. I actually really like that feature. That just feels flavorful and fun, too. So let's talk a little bit about those level one features. Um, I mean... Spell lists, totally fine. All warlocks get these spell get their own flavorful spells. I dig it. Jeremy, I'd like to pull your opinion on something. Would you like sure. it if warlocks just got to have those spells on their list of castable spells rather than having to pick them? Yeah. I would too. I've always yeah. thought that. That's all. I don't think they would do it this way if they were to redesign 5e today. I think they would just be, you have these extra spells. Yeah, such because... a weird design. Also, it's confusing yeah. too. Like for a long time, I just thought you did. Well, because it's inconsistent between different classes, which is just stupid. Anyway. Yeah, that's a quick quick sidebar. I didn't know if you were on the same camp there. Let's talk yeah. the, the defining feature of this class, which is Grasp of the Deep. So, well, first I just want to point out, compared to every other subclass, in the, and we just saw this again on the Sorcerer, every other Warlock subclass gets a spell list and one other feature. That's it. Why do we have two other features out of nowhere and two other, what I think to be, are actually meaningful features? personally um but whatever it's frustrating grasp of the deep it's a bonus action there's no spell slots use charisma modifier which is going to be five by level eight you're going to be able to do it five times a day um it's just a spiritual weapon like the spell spiritual weapon it just has a 10 foot reach for some reason I, because i guess that makes sense i sure i'm fine with that whatever and it does lightning or cold damage instead of uh, force damage. Oh, and it reduces their speed by 10 feet, which is definitely not. Um, um, oh, just as a side note, um, Celest Celestial and Hex do get two. Do they? Yeah, okay. but they are all also, also above. The oh, curve. yeah, but Celestial is one of them is a cantrip. You get a cantrip. You get two cantrips. Like, um, Hex Hexblade, you get two significant, actually very impactful feet. Well, Hexblade is... Ugh. Anyway, I don't know. I don't like this just as like, it seems... It seems too on the nose to me of like, you summon an, you follow an eldritch being, summon a thing from the eldritch being, hooray! I don't know, it, like, it's cool, but it's almost a little too on the nose. Yeah, I and it's very much powerful. dislike this design. Yeah, that's good. No two ways about that. Um, Especially I, if you combine it with very common uh, warlock spell, Hex, which would apply to these attacks. It's just, uh, you know, I mean, the level two spell, spiritual weapon, which is what this is, is largely considered one of the best spells in the game. Mm. And you're getting that level two spell for free three times at level one. So at level one, this is poor uh, An upgraded version of it with the 10 foot speed reduction. Yeah. Now it doesn't get the extra damage from your wisdom modifier, but if you do have the spell hex, which a lot of warlocks run, very, very powerful. And yeah, a blood deuce in chat is making a great point. With some Eldritch invocations that go on your Eldritch Blast, you can reduce an enemy speed by 20 feet. Which at that point, hmm, and we're going to see this become a potential issue, what blood deuce just mentioned in the chat. When we get to level 10 featured Devouring Maw. But 
Yeah. Um, Overall, this is just why. Why? Yeah, I, you, why? For me, the largest thing was I don't like features just beyond balance issues because those are, I think, very clear here. I don't like features that are this specified in what they do where it's you summon a big tentacle and it comes up and hits things. This is what you do. I think powers... Yeah, exactly. It feels like a spell. It does not feel like a class feature. The fun Mm -hmm. class features, I think, are ones that feel like they have general use and describe the way that you act, not... This is just describing something else that you can basically ask to do something. Yeah, and the bigger issue overall that I'm going to have here, and I'm going to keep coming back to this throughout our talk here, is in terms of flavor, unlike the Aberrant Mind Sorcerer, which was very different from every other sorcerer subclass, this subclass is very, very similar in flavor and aesthetic to the Great Old One subclass uh, for the Warlock. And uh, quite frankly, this subclass blows the Great Old One out of the water to the point where if I were playing a Warlock that I would have gone a Great Old One, I do not think I would ever go Great Old One over this because this is just more powerful far and away. And we're going to see that over and over again as we go through this class where at every time there is a class feature, this Lurker Warlock is better than the Great Old One. And there are a few exceptions to that. So like, for example, Scion of the Deep, you can only communicate telepathically with a few different types of things. Whereas the Great Old One can telepathically communicate with anything. Sure. Scion of the Deep is my favorite feature on this. I actually really yeah, like Scion of the Deep. It's very cool. It's very flavorful. Um, um, I talk to I sharks. Know... Yeah, talk to sharks. Why not? Uh, but... And stuff like that, you know, which doesn't add necessarily power to, because to me, when I see that feature, I don't think of that as a, a power feature, but just as like, even though it's definitely more than a ribbon, I think of that as just like, oh, that's a cool opportunity to tell stories as a DM and let the player like hear more about what these monsters' motivations are that are normally would just rampage. So I think that's great. I agree. Well, let's, let's move six. on. Yeah, yeah, let me take you to level six. Fathomless Soul. At sixth level, your patron grants you the, the grants you greater benefits. Uh, you gain the following benefits. You can breathe both air and water. You gain a swimming speed equal to your walking speed, and you gain resistance to cold damage. So this compares pretty, you know, pretty reasonably. Actually, it compares pretty favorably, I think, to the Great Old Ones in Tropic Ward, which you can impose disadvantage on an attack once per short rest. So, you know, the cold damage is pretty situational when it comes up. When it comes up, it's really good, whatever. Whereas the provoking disadvantage from the Great Old Ones ability is good all the time, but, like, you get to use it once, and then that's it. It might not do anything. Oh, wait. Oh, wait, the Lurker in the Deep gets a second 6th level ability yeah, out of nowhere, the, unlike the, the, every the single thing. other same Warlock thing. subclass? Whoa! It's also every it's other... Like... All of the original Warlock subclasses, except for the Celestial, get a feature that you get to use once, and this just breaks convention two ways. One, it gives you a second feature. Two, it doesn't keep that trend. Like, I don't know. So let's talk about Guardian's Grasp, their second 6th level feature. At 6th level, the technically you create with Grasp of the Deep can defend others... Uh, Defend you and others. When a creature, you can see, takes damage within 10 feet of the tentacle, you can use your reaction to choose one of those creatures and reduce the damage to the chosen creature by half. After doing so, the tentacle vanishes. So first problem, reduce by half. This is not the word resistance. And so this stacks with resistance. Great. Great. We're just fucking this. I hate this. This design is terrible. I'm just going to say it, it fucking sucks. This is a very overt and blatant power creep. And beyond that, it's just poorly written. This isn't good. Yeah. It looks like bad home, house homebrew to me. It feels like bad homebrew. Really shitty homebrew. Isn't reduced, is reduced the damage to the chosen creature by half? Um, no. Non-conventioned? Yeah, it'd be resistance. Gain resistance to damage. Um. No. Is conventional. Hold on a second. Let me just make sure. There's, I swear there's... Yeah, um, okay. Uh, I think I'm thinking of Uncanny Dodge is what I think of when I look at this. Uh, um, use a reaction. But there it's, it's phrased probably it should be use a reaction to have uh, rather than reduce, reduce the, damage. the damage by half, which is just a kind of a funky way of, of phrasing it, I think. It's um, 
overall, you know, this is so much more powerful. You get to use this five times. This, yeah, this ability alone, alone shits on every other ability that the other warlocks get at sixth level. I mean, and then beyond that, they get this other thing where they can, you know, breathing air and water is good, but it's situational. Swimming, Swimming speed, speed is situational. Is incredibly good, but situational. Uh, cold and damage. Cold damage, damage is, is universally. I mean, resistances are inherently situational, but a resistance is inherently is good. also it's powerful. Very, especially if it's cold damage, right? This is yeah, like it's one of the common ones. Psychic, like we had on the war on the uh, yeah, sorcery. fire, fire and cold are the two kings. This, to me, doesn't feel like it was written by the same person as the Sorcerer so far. Because this... Uh, yeah, okay. I agree. I, I don't think it's like... If, it had, if they had either of these features, I mean, if they had Fathomless Soul, actually that feels less like a sixth level Warlock feature to me than Guardian Grasp does. Like, that feels closer to what the, yeah. a Warlock would usually get. Uh, if it was either one of them, uh, it w I would think it was, yeah, a little overtuned, but I can probably live with that. Um, but both of them is obviously. Yeah. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just not a big fan right now of what we're seeing, and I'm gonna be even less of a fan when we go on to this tenth level feature. Yeah, let's let's talk design. devouring maw. Um, so what a st fucking shit storm. Uh, starting at tenth level, you can magically draw forth the manifestation of your patron's insatiable hunger as an action. Choose a point you can see within sixty feet of you for one minute. A translucent maw manifests in a ten foot radius centered on that point. Each creature in that area, when the maw appears, must succeed on a strength saving throw against your spell save DC or be restrained. Any creature that starts its turn in the maw's area takes 3d6 cold or lightning damage. Your choice when it takes the damage. As an action, a restrained creature can repeat the saving throw. I'm sorry, I was rereading that for a second for myself. I need to re-understand that. Uh, ending the restraint on a success. At the start of your turn, if there's a creature in the maw's area, you gain temporary hit points equals your warlock level. Once you do so, once you use this feature, you can't do so again until you finish a short or long rest. Um, I mean, this ability is outrageously stacked. Um, and, well, first of all, like, the best you could possibly get on another Warlock level 10 feature, I think, is the, the um, maybe the Fiend Pact, because they get a resistance at level 10. Yeah, I, there's nothing. Resistance. I mean, there's nothing comparable to this. Yeah, I mean, uh, sorry, Celestial, you get some temp hit points as well, and you can give some people temp hit points. This is just a very good spell, because it restrains, it does ongoing damage, and it heals you. Without a spell slot, without concentration, it, without the possible, possibility of countering. And again, this is a spell. This feels like a spell, not a class feature. Yeah, Again. it's also, the damage is absolute. There's not any question about, like, there's no, like, you can prevent it if you save well enough. No, it's just, you take the damage always. Yeah. So it's got that bonus for it. And the thing for me that really destroys this thing is the creatures don't repeat the saving throw at the end of their turn. They have to use an action to get out of the restraint. So yeah. they have to take their turn. It's like a mega restraint uh, in yeah. that regard. Um, I think... This is obviously overtuned to an outrageous degree. Um, to just, and, and, but without like going that, into too much on it. Beyond like. that, right? Like what Blood was saying earlier in the chat with the being able to slow the shit out of creatures with your tentacle and your Eldritch Blasts. Hell, with the, uh, you know, there's Eldritch Blast abilities that you pull and push creatures. Slowing a creature's speed by 20 feet and being able to move it 10 feet a turn. Hey, you can just keep them in here. There's literally nothing a normal creature can do besides nothing. It's just nothing once you get it in there. Um, it's there. Yeah, it's, and you're just it's, stacking up those hit point temp hit points. I in mean, the just, um, in the context of ugh. some of the other features and other things the warlock can get, it's it's problematic. I think, like I said, to not like dwell on this because this is just so far out of the realm. I think it's not worth like I don't know. It's just it's way over tuned. My thoughts are give, uh, I would raise the damage to 46, give it a save, or give it like a save where it's like you can not take it on a constitution or something. I would remove the, you save at the save ends, I would make it last a round. Like, There's just that's my so first, much, yeah, and that's so like, about this, that's wrong. Yeah, that was like four discrete changes I had to make to get this to a level where I would be like comfortable with it and. And it even then, ridiculous. 
when you compare this to all the other warlock abilities, this is the one thing that's not like the other. Yeah, it's it's this is the one right. that doesn't fit in in terms of what it accomplishes. And it's just like, man. Uh, well, um, let's go on to Unleash the Depths, which I think is actually relatively tame in comparison to the rest of this uh, class and, like, the pattern that we're seeing here. Uh, yeah. Do you want to read this one, Jeremy? Sure. Unleash the Depths. Starting at 14th level, you gain the ability to call upon your patron for aid. As an action, you can choose a point within 30 feet of you where your patron tears through reality, manifesting a measure of its thalassic grandeur. Choose one of the following effects to issue from this manifestation point. Once you use either effect, you can't use this feature again until you finish a long list. Transport. You have up to five willing creatures of your choice that you can see within 30 feet of the manifestation point are grappled by spectral tentacles and yanked through your patron's realm. The tentacles transport you and the chosen creatures to a point of your choice within 100 miles that you have visited within the past 24 hours. The tentacles then vanish. Fury. You can direct a barrage of spectral tentacles to issue forth and strike up to five creatures you can see within 30 feet of the manifestation point. Each target must make a dexterity saving throw against your spell save DC. On a failed save, the creature takes 60 10 cold or lightning damage, your choice, and is knocked prone. On a successful save, it takes half damage and is not knocked prone. The tentacles then vanish. Um, this isn't as good as the 10th level feature. Yeah. Um, this is totally fine to me. This feels like a warlock capstone. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm not, like, inspired by it in any means. Like, I don't find it interesting. But I think the balance is on par with other warlock capstones, I think. Yeah, I mean, other warlock capstones are, what, 10d10 to one creature, pretty much no save. This is 6d10 to five creatures, but they have to say They, you know, get a chance to save. So um, I think, yeah, this is fine. Like a Dark Delirium, which, like, kind of can cripple one creature. Like, I don't know, there's a lot of different... Yeah, it's definitely got much more utility in the transport. Uh, yeah, it's far. got the transport option, but um, that feels cool. And for a high-level feature, one of the things I mentioned that I had a problem with this is it feels so specific where it's like, you summon a big mouth that holds things down, you yeah. get a tentacle and it whacks things. I'm actually okay with that degree of specificity on a high-level thing because it specifies in this ability, this isn't like you doing it, this is your patron showing up to help. So it's okay to me. Like, that flavor works for me on a high-level feature. I agree, because you've earned it yeah. by that point. And I feel like a lot of classes have that, right? The Cleric, you get to level 10, you get Divine Intervention. You have earned a chance that your god may look down upon you and grant you succor. And that's what a high-level feature should feel like. Yeah. And, um, yeah. So I think they're on the mark on this. But I agree. to this re is good. summarize, yeah, um, to re-summarize the whole thing, it's just way too powerful. This is just a, way too good. It's way too good, and it's way too horny on Great Old One's game. Like, it's just too close. I just think that, like, this shit needs to back off. I, it, I think it's just too, too similar. Um, you know, if I they think... wanted this to truly be a water-centric thing, I think they should have gone in a design that was more focused on water. Because that it's not. There's one wow. ability in here that requires water. And that is the one that lets you swim in the water and breathe in the water. To hedge this, oh, I a guess bit. you can talk to uh, water. On uh, for my thinking on this, though, the problem with I because I think there is a design space here. I think a kraken warlock is a space that has value. I think it's the general. Just I think the old one warlock is so generic that it makes it so there's kind of a, a hard to like fill up a lot of valid spaces um for example like i thought the what's it the undying warlock i also was thinking of that as a little bit of, of chomping on the great old one as well even though that one's kind of bad um but i remember thinking like wait, wait a minute oh, and I, you hit the nail on the head there if it's not busted i'm okay with it if they're of the same caliber it can be close. It can be similar. But doesn't it make it... I mean, I would rather, like, 
the old one warlock is just so like <laughs> like almost like milk toast aberrant like it's just anything that's kind of spooky can be old one like fiend is very specific your patron is a devil or a demon uh, uh -huh. Fey is you're from the Fey Wild. Old one is everything else that's scary. Yeah. Uh, which is like a design space. They wanted to fill that, and I get that for the player's handbook, but now like I don't know. I don't think there's I agree with you that it shouldn't be better than the old one. But I feel like if you're worried too much about tramping on the old one's design, you're cutting off a lot of like interesting design spaces. And I think you can tramp on the design a little bit. I think Undying did it actually really well because it wasn't just an improvement. This is just stronger than the old one, pretty much across the board. The only oh, thing absolutely. that I would That's... say the old one has on this is the Create Thrall at level 14. And even then, that's a real funky feature. But, like... I, I don't know, man. There's just so much off with this. I would want to see how they actually fixed this thing before I could even really reasonably say whether I, mean, I think that's, it's... That's, that's fair. Um, um, I'm just saying, like, I wouldn't limit the design space. I, I mean, you just, you just got to make this weaker. Like, I have no issue with the flavor of this class, other than that they poorly but, executed on the flavor for me as well. Which is a side of the point. How do the they text. make this weaker? How do you, you know, maintain the design they've already done here and just tone it down? Because I don't think you can. That's, yeah, well, I don't like the design that they've done here. Yeah, well, um, so it's tough to, it's tough to like think about that because I don't even, I wouldn't want to balance this because I don't like, like Grasp of the Deep, which is what everything's built around. Um, Everything's built around. That's another problem. Is yeah, that is actually super problematic. Is is every other warlock subclass gets tools? This one has this like, this one has a tool kit. If that makes sense. Yeah, the tools um, are intended to work together in a specific way, yeah. and that's just never limits fun. creativity in play. Um, yeah, it's never fun long term. It's fun to be on the in, on the outset, but. Ugh. Anyway, I think, you know, I think we've gone back and forth enough. This is, we are in agreement, I think, at the core, which is that yeah. this is not good, well done. It's bad. <laughs> yep. Uh, do we want to talk about Mind Sliver, the new spell, pretty quick? Oh, Christ. Yeah, let's look at Mind Sliver real quick. All right. They also threw out a, a cantrip, basically, to go along with the, uh, the aberrant, uh, the aberrant sorcerer. I couldn't remember the name of the class. Uh, it's an enchantment cantrip, casting time, one action. Sick range of 60 feet, verbal components only, and it has uh, less for one round. You drive a disorienting spike of psychic energy into the mind of one creature you can see within range. The target must make an intelligence saving throw. Unless the saving throw is successful, the target takes 1d6 psychic damage, and the first time it makes a saving throw before the end of your next turn, it must roll a d4 and subtract the number rolled from the save. The spell's damage increases by 1d6 when you reach certain levels. 5, 11, standard cantrip progression. Um, I actually think this is a little bit too good. Yeah, it's definitely very powerful. Um, and the fact that it hits saving throws, is that's the problem. Uh, yeah. Very, very, very good. Um, it's kind of a better cutting it, words. It uh, not cutting words, uh, it's just mockery. Yeah, like, if this did one psychic damage and gave them a minus d4 on their save, it would still probably be very good. Yeah. Um, at minimum, I would make it a 1d4 to make it more comparable to Vicious Mockery. But then I think it's still better than Vicious Mockery, but I wouldn't, like, begrudge it necessarily because it occupies a slightly different space. Well, and um, a very minor nitpick on my part. Why is this an enchantment spell? Um, this, should be, this should be a divination spell. But whatever. That's, yeah, that I don't know. That's I don't like illusion does psychic a lot too. There's some, yeah. I don't know. I definitely I I'm agreeing. The enchantment feels a little funky for it. One d four, I would say, is the it's obvious still, change. Uh, I... <sighs> it's better at one d four, but yeah, it, it's hard to tell. I don't know. I I think that the saving throw thing. When is it like? Okay, say it's also the fact that it hits intelligence, which is or such the a... end of your next turn. So this sets up your own abilities. 
Yeah, it's so frequently, but I mean, more realistically, it sets up a, a party ability. Um, I guess if you're battling by yourself, you can make them roll 1d4 lower on the saves against other I, mind slivers. Um, I don't know, man. Like, there's a reason if you look at every single magic item in Dungeons and Dragons, there are, what, two that affect your spell saves, DC? A uh, spell save DC? Oh, no, no. no. The, I'm, what, I'm with staff, you. Like, affecting staff saving throws. Staff of the Magi? Legendary this also staff? lets you fish in a way that, like, where it's like you just keep throwing this at them until they fail, and then you cast, a like, a powerful spell at them. And yeah. they have, like, this thing. Stacks with Bane, like, I don't know, there's I'm a lot of... Bad. There's anyway. a lot of issues. Yeah. And it's the saving throw thing. I don't um, like it at all. It's very, it's very gamey, I think. As, um, in a way that a lot of the other cantrips don't feel as gamey. Uh, yeah, I would maybe, like, 1d4. You could do, like, ability check. I'd be fine with ability check. And keep yeah. it a d6. I'm, yeah. I think that actually, wait, but wait, grapples. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd still... Grapples don't matter. It doesn't matter what they're bonus, what they're taking away from grapples. You're yeah, it's already succeed. If, if you want to grapple people, you're going to succeed to grapple them. That's because no one, no one has proficiencies in 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons. Anywho, we're meander, we're rambling at this point. Uh, our wrap up, Pete, what are our overall thoughts about these two uh, new subclasses for 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons? Sorcerer, too powerful, but great. Agreed. Uh, Warlock, too powerful and bad. Agree. <laughs> I don't know about you, Pete, but I think I would put this warlock at the bottom of these of the six recently released on Earth Arcana. Yeah, uh, when I came I'd in, put at the very bottom. I, I definitely came in thinking more highly of it than I did like after like really focusing on some of these. Um, I still, I just like loathe the. Uh, I just loathe the arms, but I actually would rather have the Fey Barbarian than than this. Yeah, so I think it's the second to the bottom. For oh, you just you you hate the astral self? So yeah, much? I just do not like the astral self. I can't remember what it was at this point, but there was something in there that I felt like just destroyed. Well, art. Yeah, uh, there's something in there that I felt like destroyed the game for me, and I can't remember what that was. Mm-hmm. Um, and this, and I this, think it was uh, just extra attacks being tacked on from. No, oh, no that might have been it. Yeah. Um, the Devouring Ma is a similar feature in that regard. Um, yeah, so this is... Uh, and I'll say this, last time we were talking about what our favorites were, the Heroic Paladin was at the top of my list, even though it had problems. This Aberrant Mind Sorcerer has, has far outstripped what I thought of the Heroic Paladin. And this still has huge problems. Yeah, it's true. So... I guess the big takeaway is the most recent ideas in Unearthed Arcana that have been coming out, some cool concepts, less cool design, and then everything's got some issues that really need to get worked out before they get public. So I think that just about wraps us for the evening. Indeed it does. Um, Let's talk announcements. Tune in to our other content. Uh, On Friday, we have Pete and Jeremy's D&D time. This is the last time we'll get to say that this is the beginning of our Carnival of Souls event. If you like spooks and scares, uh, it's our Halloween event. Uh, We do it all through the month of October. It's an absolute blast. We do an ongoing story. There's exclusive loot. I'm really excited to dive into it in a couple of days now. Only only two days away at this point. Uh, And I hope all of you are as well. I can't wait to see you on Friday. And if you uh, maybe tuned in after our very beginning, uh, I'm going to be putting a link in the chat right now to our Carnival of Souls page on our website. And of course, we will be announcing this in the actual chat on Discord as well. Now, um, tonight, I've got some stuff going on very shortly. So we're not going to be sticking around for Ask Pete and Jeremy this evening. But Pete, we're going to cover that next week for certain. Make sure to get those questions in for next time. Um, Jeremy, there's actually only one question, and it was golems or dinosaurs. Oh my god, we gotta answer that. Dinosaurs! Golems. Dinosaur! 
stars. <laughs> golems. All right. I pick golems. Who All asked? right. Who asked that? Uh, that was by a uh, question by the green or gray. And now, Pete, why did you pick golems? Uh, I like golems. That's it. I just think golems are cool. I'm not crazy Maybe about that. Maybe you should thinking the dinosaurs are cool. I think dinosaurs are cool, but I think golems are very cool. All right. Well, with that, thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, hopefully we have elucidated you just a little bit as to this new Unearthed Arcana. Hopefully you're, you know, as invested and impassioned about it as we are. Um, you know, we come across as very negative, but in, in this initial design phase, that's kind of our job, right? To be critical. Yeah. So, I don't know. I all. feel like I had a lot of positive stuff to say too. Like I like a lot of this stuff. Me too. <laughs> Uh, no, I really, I really do though. It's it's quite yeah. cool. It's just some of the designs a little dicey on my end, to me. Uh, but yeah, uh, that's uh, all that we're gonna be doing tonight. Uh, thank you again for watching, everybody. I'm Pete, and I'm Jeremy, and this is and this is D and D time, time talks. Good night, everyone. Good night.